thick of it. Like I said, last month we went through four of the miracles of Jesus, and we're doing them in chronological order, which is kind of fun. Maybe you didn't know where these par- where you call the parables miracles fell, but we want to really dig together in here and see where God is in these stories together. So I'm giving you fair warning as I read them. Be thinking about you know what the story means to you or where you see God leading in this story or anything else. And we would love to hear from you. Marlon's going to go after me. We're going to do a couple together. And then Marlon will finish us up with that as well. So our first miracle is going to be in Matthew 8, 16 to 7. I'm going to read. By the way, this came on the heels of last time we ended with Peter's mother-in-law was sick and Jesus healed her. So this is like right after this happened, this is what we get here. So this is Matthew 8, 16 through 17. And it's also found in Mark 1, 32 to 34. And in Luke 4, 40 to 41. But I'm going to read out of Matthew for this. And it says this. That evening, so this is right after mother-in-law has been healed. They brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So one of the things last time that we noticed, we were only a couple of miracles in, is that Jesus, his first miracle, he doesn't start with healing miracles. He does get to them, but he doesn't start with that. And part of the reason we were talking about that was because, as we can see, as soon as he starts doing that, he is bombarded by requests and people that want these healing miracles. And those are important, too, but Jesus is trying to make a point, and we're going to see that at various various times, that it's not just about physical healing. But here we see that crowd just comes in, and it says they brought people oppressed by demons and cast them out with a word and healed them. So I want to throw this out to the group. Anybody have any thoughts on this particular miracle? Where do you see God here? What do you see him doing and saying to us? It's interesting that they start off with this demon possession thing. It's it's a big thing, apparently. Um, That... So many people are involved in it, but you look around us and so many people are in, um, already possessed with the demons in your necks of the woods. You may not call it that. You may call it drug addiction. You may call it um, uh, they're so full of themselves. Uh, their, their life has always got to be a complete turmoil all the time. And, it, and you meet people that'll go off the handle all the time on, on just the littlest things. And we know it, anything that is not God sent is from the devil. Mm-hmm. So in these aspects, they are a devil possession. They have addictions. You look at the, the rate of addictions mm-hmm. in our cities and around us. It is almost next to impossible to get workers in most of these, uh, the job sector right out there that are faithfully coming to work because they've got either sickness or some sort of addictions, whether it's gaming all night or whether it's uh, um, doing drugs or alcohol or, or the party scene. They have got these addictions. Yeah, and that's not like you were saying, too, that's all, all around us. I mean, I... Some of you don't know I'm a counselor, so I talk to people who this is this is the life that they're trying to, to leave. It's all around us. Alaska has some of the worst rates for addiction, has some of the worst rates for domestic violence. People feel very, very hopeless. And I think, Marlon, you're bringing out a good point here. We're talking about demon sessions. These aren't just always just physical ailments. They can be people being tormented in their mental state, and that's that's a real thing. We know that. Again, we may not call it that, but there are so many people who are in an epidemic of mental health, as they say, since since COVID. People are talking about it all the time. What What's the answer, though, here in the Bible, right? When people are being brought to Jesus, Jesus says, how many things How many things does it say he says to them? It says, with a word. word. <laughs> he doesn't have to. Sometimes he says a lot more, but in this particular case, he says, with a word. 
just in that one word. I mean, think about the power in God's words. Let's go back to Genesis for a second. God created by? Yeah, it's word of mouth. Word, right? Same thing right here. That same. This is the same. This is God. It's God in human flesh. That same word that had the creative power is right here when people are coming to him with these problems, physical ailments, mental ailments, whatever. And by the one word, and it says, and they, and he healed all. I don't know if anybody has been around somebody who's changed their life, that God has touched. I hope we all have. Hopefully our own lives are like that. But there are some some stories that stick with you. If you've ever been with somebody and you saw what they were, and you see that difference and you're going, maybe you weren't actually in moment. You're like, what is different? Mm-hmm. Right? And then somebody tells you, I've seen these stories. Mm-hmm. I've been a part of these stories in, in counseling where people have turned away from addictions. And I'm going, well, mostly in counseling, I'm Unless somebody brings it up, I can't say a lot about a lot about God, but I can see that God's working in people's lives when I see these lives change. And I will tell you, anytime that I ask somebody, one of the questions I ask people is like, what's important to you? What do you value? It's a great, a great kind of question. Nobody ever comes back to me and says, Well, I value being dishonest and I value alcohol and I value all these other things. Nobody ever says that to me. I've asked that question of I'm not kidding, hundreds of people. And they always come back with something that connects with, especially the fruits of the spirit. Well, I value love. I value kindness. I value honesty. And from there we go, okay, so you, this is what you're saying. You're valuing are the, are what you're doing lining up. And you can really see that even if they don't call it God, that that spirit, spirit of God is working on people all around and you can see you can see life change. And of course, it's even more miraculous when you see somebody who then gives the credit to God and the, et cetera. But I also love to hear that at the last part of this is this to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So we know that repeatedly Jesus is fulfilling all those things that were mentioned about him. But it points out Matthew, it points us back to that. This is already what was told, that when Jesus comes and God comes, he's going to heal, heal all these illnesses and our diseases. And in this particular case, with a word, the power of the word of God. And that was why earlier in our challenge, we were talking about being being in the word of God as well. But some God can do that with also just one, one little word over, over our hearts and minds. I think that's what amazes me, that even people that come in and are, if you will, scraping the bottom of the barrel... You can still see that God's trying to reach them by the things that you hear them say. You can still hear them again. If I ask them that value question, they could be in the throes of addiction. They never tell me, well, I value addic- being addicted to this. They never tell me that. They go, well, yeah, I want this or that for my life. Okay. That is not, that's not them. I look at those moments where that's, that's God talking on through his hearts. We, we know somewhere in there, right? So it's just amazing to me at this, just these two little verses that we could dig in there that see the power of the word of God and that he wants to heal. Then this is another thing we were talking about, you know, what does God like and do? Like right there it says that God wants to heal us. People were brought to him in that particular case, he healed all of them. He didn't leave anybody hanging in that case. And that is ultimately what he wants. And no, I just want to acknowledge too that certainly there are times where that doesn't happen. We can, we can think of people that are dealing with illnesses probably right now, and you're going like, God, why aren't you healing this person? And those are the hardest things, I think, to come to grips with, maybe in our own lives, whether it's a mental health or a physical thing. But what we do know about God, and we just looked in the future, though, that's not going to be there in the future, right? Even if that's what we have now, that's not what, what God wants for us, and that is not what God is about. He wants to heal. And people were seeing that and coming to him, and he was just overloaded in this case. He was able to, to do that quickly and get those people out. So I want to take us over to the next story. This one's in Luke, and this is Luke chapter 5. And this is a miracle called the first miraculous catch of fish. So, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the Lake of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little bit from land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, 
Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish and that they had taken. And with him also was James and John, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now remember we were doing this in chronological order. We did see some disciples before. But this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry that we're looking at. So you, you, this is why doing it chronologically is kind of helpful. Is You might have thought, oh, this happened elsewhere because it happened so early in Luke. But Jesus has already started healing. He's already started his ministry. He's turned that water to wine, if you will, at the beginning. And now he does a very specific miracle. And in this miracle, I, I really love this. I heard someone talking about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, this miracle, um, and was talking about just imagining being there, being Peter, and your boat that Jesus gets in. And there's so many people, right? Because remember, we just saw, this helps us set up, like, why Jesus gets so popular, is we keep seeing he's healing, so these people just keep coming and coming. And it's so many people that he's like, I gotta, I gotta get out. And those of you who know anything about acoustics as well, if you get out on the water, gets out a little ways, so the acoustics are good, people can hear him well, and he's preaching, and when he's done, though, he turns to Simon. He says, "Go, let's go out and let's go get some fish. And what is Simon? This is Peter. What's his response to him? He says, yeah, he goes, this is just my imagination for a second. Well, master, we've, we've already done that. We usually fish at night. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. And we got nothing. It's, it's kind of like he's telling Jesus, like, hey, I know you're not, like, we're the fishermen here, and like you really don't know, but this is not the time to come get the fish. We are we already tried, didn't happen. We're not gonna catch them in daylight. Um, but he says, "There's that word again." But in the English language, word. but at your word, right? Even though he goes, "I don't see the point in doing this," but because you said so, which means they've already developed a relationship. I will let down the nets. Wow. I mean, just think of that. Jesus tells him to go do this. And he's like, uh, have any of you ever been there? Like God's telling you to do something like, Lord, I don't know if you understand the situation, <laughs> right? but you know, uh, but hopefully you, you eventually go, oh, okay. You finish that. I've been there. I've been there multiple times. I'm like, I don't know, Lord, if you understand, this is what we're up against. I've prayed yeah. for a boatload of fish before. Yeah. <laughs> Marlon has, Marlon has absolutely done it. Those of you in fishing will, will get this. And when they put the nest down, what happens? <laughs> the boat is oh, yeah, the, the boat is sinking yeah, so much so they're like, ah, get the other guys over here. Oh. John and James, help us. Yeah, we're, we're literally sinking. So when Jesus performs this miracle, he doesn't perform just a little bit and they catch just a little fish. They catch a ton of fish that they have overloaded the boat and they've got to call the other guys in. But Peter immediately recognizes what he's done. Because he, he was all like, I don't know, Lord, if you get this. When he sees this, he's like, whoa, mm -hmm. you really are who you say you are, right? And and what does he see in himself? Simple. He goes, well, I am I am a sinful man. Like, I have just, I have just basically argued with God, doubted God, and just get away from me. Like, there's no mm -hmm. way that we can be friends here, right? He, and... Everybody around them is astonished by this cast, but what Jesus says to him, he's trying to make a point of this, right? He says, what they always, what he always says, do not be afraid. Okay, that should be the answer. So don't be afraid. What is the point that he's trying to make? He tells him, because now on you're going to do what? You're going to, yes, you're going to catch men. He, and this is the abundance that you see here. He's, he, he doesn't give them just a few fish so that Peter and everybody else goes, well, when Jesus said we're going to catch Men, we're just going to catch a few people here. Mm -hmm. No, Jesus is like, I want you to remember this piece when you're doubting me. There mm -hmm. are tons of people. The fields are ripe for people. Fish, this abundance of fish should remind you 
what I have set you out to do. Brooke, uh, yes. if I could, um, John brings out this word in the beginning, this John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. Mm -hmm. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And then you jump down to 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, who is writing this gospel, was one of them fishermen that was witnessing in mm -hmm. one of the boats that was filled. Yeah, uh, hence why this is the place that you're going to find it, because mm -hmm. this is not in any other place. <coughs> John puts this in, in the story for a reason, for the for the disciples. So I'm going to open the floor. Anybody have any thoughts or things they'd like to share about this particular miracle? Like I see some nothing. Yes? I was going to say, never doubt God. Yes, never doubt God. Absolutely. April, never what? think you're catching him up. That's what he was doing. Well, God, yeah. he, he missed this part. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. April, what, I saw yeah. you mouth in something as well. <laughs> Love I kind of said what Nikki said. Yeah. Um, basically, trusting God. Yeah, yeah. trusting God. Yeah. No doubt him. I think the beauty of this miracle to me as well is that as we're going through the miracles, he does all kinds. And this is a very specific and particular miracle for certain people. Like what we just saw a moment ago was everybody in that town come and get healed. This one is just very particular. And I think that we should be aware that God can perform those little, this is a big miracle, bigger miracle. Like see that, but sometimes we have miracles in our lives and I know there's stories out here where people can go, God did that for me. That was a miracle for me or a handful of people. He does miracles on the small level and on the big level. So we should, shouldn't doubt that he can do those those small miracles. And, of course, in this mm -hmm. case, he was doing that so that the disciples would remember and be able to come back to this when he says, this is what God has called you to do. Remember this? It was specifically for, for them. Peter's really impacted with this particular miracle. I mean, mm -hmm. to the point where he recognizes this is a God thing. Mm -hmm. yep. This can only be a God thing, and he recognizes that I'm a sinful person. What are you doing on my boat? Why do you even have this conversation with me? I'm just a dirty old fisherman, and and yet you want to talk with me? You want to perform a miracle for me? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we see it at the latter part of Jesus' ministry doing the same thing. And Peter gets so excited, he just books off the boat and swims for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't want to miss this last piece before I turn it over to Marlon for some more uh, miracles. It says, this is really the turning point after this. They left everything and followed him. If you miss that in there, I want to point that out. We saw other miracles. He's performing other miracles, but right here, this individual personalized miracle for them, this was the pivotal point for them and they dropped everything and said, okay, we are not fishing anymore. We're going with you. So next one is going to be in Matthew 8. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. So he's in extreme pain. Um, and Jesus said to him, I will come and I will heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority having soldiers <laughs> under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to the other one, come, and he comes. And to my servants, do this, and they do it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and set down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be 
cast out into utter darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way. As you have believed, so it will be done to you, for you. And the servant was healed that same Amen. hour. Now there's a lot taking place in there. And Jesus is making several different points in that one. What jumps out at you uh, about this story? Do they have an, have an idea? What jumps out? Oh, man. The faith of the centurion. The faith is incredible, isn't it? I we get to, a lot of people like to get wrapped up in the Bible that it's all about the Hebrews and everything else or about the Jewish faith and the, the Jews and all this. Jesus healed. If you look at the healing and start counting, Jesus heals a fair amount of people that have nothing to do with the Jews. Mm -hmm. I mean, people that may, may, for the Jewish part, maybe they'd stick their nose up and say, man, I don't want nothing to do with Jesus jumps right in there and says, hey, I'm going to, I'll go with you to your house, to the centurion. And the centurion says, no, all you have to do is just speak the word. Because I'm a man of authority. So if he recognized him as king of kings, lord of lords, it's mm -hmm. it just falls in the suit, the chain of command. Jesus is that chain of command, the highest end of that chain of the command. He speaks the word, and it would be done. And Jesus was a fulfillment of that. You know, mm -hmm. through Abraham's seed, the whole world would be blessed. And this is what Jesus' mission was. And it's for the whole world. It doesn't turn anybody no, away. That wasn't <laughs> not in his vocabulary. Now, there's one part here where it's talking about so many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to the other one. What do you think he's speaking of there? I mean, you're, you're alluding it to it already. He's, he's offered this to everyone. Yeah, to everybody. And, and so just because we fall under the name of Seventh-day Abbas, and I uh, preach this quite often, it's... Uh, Find that in the Bible, would you please? Yeah. You're not finding that name in there. You're not finding Baptist. You're not finding Catholic. You're not finding there is God's people. Yeah. Of all races, all all parts of it, there is God's people. And yes, I think there's a whole lot of God's people in this seven day church. They're trying their very best to be that type of people, but they are in a lot of other places too. And that's what he's referring to. These people are walking in because they've been on the outskirts of maybe listening to Jesus out there, and you don't recognize them, you don't know them, but they were listening the whole time. They were yeah. developing a relationship with God, and they're accepting it, and they're going to be in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to be in heaven. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Chapter 8, 1. Jesus is performing a miracle there. And there's some really unique things here to look at and contemplate. Because Jesus does things that <laughs> doesn't seem like it's a, a popular thing to do. What book are you in? I'm in Matthew. Matthew 8. Matthew. Matthew 8. Oh, okay. Matthew 8 oh, okay. Right at the very beginning. Okay. And when he came down from the mountain, a great multitude followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. Mm -hmm. And Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be clean. I am willing, be clean. Mm -hmm. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now he's, now who's he, who's he talking about the testimony to? It looks like it's going to be the priest. <laughs> yeah. You know, not many people get healed of leprosy, but he's going there. 
What do you, what do you see unique out of the story? I see unique that Jesus actually touched him. Yes. I mean, it, it makes a point of telling us that he touched a man who had leprosy at that point, which was you didn't do because leprosy was a fatal disease and it was very catching. Mm -hmm. So he stretched out his hand and, you know, put himself in harm's way, as it were, mm -hmm. to make the point that you need to not just talk to or you reach out and touch someone. We all live in such small little communities here in Southeast and uh, Wrangell being no exception. And there's so many people that you know are widows or widowers and uh, are uh, or just old and older people who have nobody at home and different things like that. I really try to make it my mission when I see them coming in the door, I go over and give a hug. Oh. You know, or shake their hand or something like that. Because these people need it. Mm -hmm. There is nobody at home to give them that love no more. Mm -hmm. And so many of them will say, thank you for that hug. I needed that hug. And it, uh, and it blesses me just as much as it does them. In the middle of COVID, it was, it was a taboo thing to do, but it didn't yeah. slow me down too much. I, I, I knew one lady that was uh, almost 100 at the time, and she was going to the dentist office, and I seen her get out of the van, and I went over and gave her a big old hug. <laughs> we all know, we all know uh, Missy Wright. She is 100, going on 101 right at the moment. <laughs> And, uh, wow. and she greatly appreciates a, a hug. Any of us that have gave her a hug and, and um, can testify to this. Uh. But Wrangell is a very huggy community. But it, and it, one of the things that COVID was robbing people from in mm -hmm. all places was touch and human contact. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, and isolation. It, and it was my way of being a rebel, <laughs> well, rebel against it. Is like, oh no, there was more. There's more damage to being lonely, and and being the outcast than there is being acceptable and loved. Well, and Marlon, can I say this is the first time we've seen in the miracles this this word? I think, anyways, Lord, if you if you will, that like he's acknowledging when he comes up to the up to him that he, Jesus could do this. Like you already hear the faith when he comes up there, yeah. if you will. He doesn't, he's not like, if you can, if you think you can, mm -hmm. if you will. And mm -hmm. how many of us have prayed, like, if it's your will, God, and this is this is the first miracle I've seen somebody say that in there, asking. They're going, if you, if you will. In other words, I know you can, what will you? So there was, and it's a good point, because there was other places that Jesus refused to go in and even heal anybody in. Mm -hmm. or it said that he couldn't or wouldn't mm -hmm. heal in certain places because of their lack of faith I mean it, Jesus was something to mock at mm -hmm. and was get what we can get you know if I can get healed from good mm -hmm. but I still think he's you know this is just a freak of nature I don't know how he does it but in other place people including this one mm -hmm knew that he was the son of God. Yes. And he could heal exactly if you were willing. And it, that's that's a tough prayer for any of us, Steve. We all want to, Jesus, heal me. Well, what if it's not his will? Mm -hmm. What if whatever our ailment or, or the things that we're struggling with is so that God can be glorified in another way. And you think, how, how can that be? But if people see that by faith, you never lose your faith, mm -hmm. that you still hold on tight to a Lord who allows us sometimes to suffer in this old wicked world, yeah. pass away. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? But, you know, they need to know that there is still a faith that will stand no matter what. Exactly. Mm -hmm. no matter. 
You know, you, the last portion of that, at verse 4, it says, See that you tell no one and, and go your way and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift of Moses commanded as a testimony to them. It's interesting that Jesus never says, Okay, um, don't tell anybody because now you're part of a rebel group. No, he says, Do what is right, do what is required, do what it. Actually, who, who gave all the laws to Moses in the first place? It was, it was God. You know? And so he's, he's not, he's, go fulfill what you're supposed to do. Um, go take care of the business that you're supposed to get done. But don't tell them that I healed you. Just present yourself to them. And they'll, they'll know the facts. Here I am. I don't have leprosy anymore. And give the gift you're supposed to give. That way they don't have a bias against Jesus with him. Well, you were healed by Jesus? Uh, no, it's, it's probably fake. You, it's just makeup. You'll be back at it tomorrow. No. He went in to present it so he could be be given a certificate yeah, to yeah, go home yeah, to yeah. be a part of society again. That's I think that, but later... Yeah, that was the certificate that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, that but later is as a testimony of, um, to them of who Jesus is. You know, They're going to find out eventually how you got healed. <laughs> Your relatives are going to know. <laughs> You're not going to keep this a secret for very long. <laughs> Well, for those of you who are at the Wrangell Church, we're going to continue on with the miracles next month.